Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manish Cranny. Danny Berger is out this week. It is Bloomberg Booth. Let's set your agenda. June rate cuts reappraised to the toss of a coin as the U.S. manufacturing snaps back. UBS plans to buy back shares to the value of $2 billion beginning this year. And Tesla may be headed for a gloomy milestone as waning EV demand takes its toll on sales. A very good morning. Suddenly, the uh, equity market is doing battle with an 11-bit rise in the bond market. So suddenly, rate cuts do matter to the equity market. Spoos are down by a tenth of 1%. Uh, JP Morgan make the point that the equity market has so far been pretty much uh, immune to what's going on in the rate markets. But we need to close that gap, and you need to close that gap in the form of earnings. Tesla at the bottom of your screen, we're waiting for those deliveries. Byte, uh, BYD taking uh, literally chunks and bites out of the Tesla treasure trove of a demand in China. So stocks are that little bit lower. You're going to get a raft of Fed speak. By the way, in Europe, you can see the energy component. Oil is at a five-month high. The likes of Total and NER are both a bit up this morning. So the energy component is at a five-month high. You're seeing a nice, a nice bid tone there. Roll it over, have a look at the bond market. As I say, there was a little bit of a, a damascene moment for the bond market yesterday. Prices paid in the ISM data. That's in the belly of the data is really uh, what irked this market. Good news for the economy is bad news for the rates market. Uh, as you can see, 10-year yields at the moment, they're steadying their nerves. Spiked by 11 basis points yesterday. You saw this curve steepening go through. Oil is up uh, as we see this tension uh, between the strikes from Israel on Iranian assets inside Syria. What is the next step of retaliation potentially from the Iranians? That is what the market is debating there. And as we go slightly risk off in equities, bid up in bonds, and the rate cut narrative shifts, so Bitcoin gives ever such a little bit back. Now, as we've been saying to you, strong ISM data sinks in. The odds of uh, that rate cut for June slipped to below 50%. Our next guest writes this. It is Bano Baveja, and this is what he says. We agree that inflation will continue to moderate over the coming year. We're much less certain about the growth outlook, given the recent rise in the short data break-evens. The market's concern seems to be the opposite. Banu joins us now. He is the chief strategist at UBS. So, Banu, good to have you with me. You talk about the market's left tail risk is an inflation resurgence, not a growth drop. But you, you have your doubts about growth dropping. You think a little bit more risk of a growth drop rather than the second coming of inflation. Why? When you look at inflation, Manus, um, most of the inflation data that had been very strong for a long period of time, energy, food, uh, supply bottleneck driven inflation in goods, that has begun to come off in a very material fashion. And the remaining inflation, as the Fed chair likes to focus on, which is sort of core services, ex-housing, that hasn't come off as yet. But we are seeing signs of a slow and steady weakening in the labor market, or as Fed speakers like to say, the labor market coming into a greater balance, the supply of labor increasing, the demand of labor coming down. And that should mean that over time, over time, because you are going to get a payrolls report this week, which I think is going to be quite strong, both in terms of the headline number and also in terms of the average wages, we do think that over time these wages will begin to come off. The quits rate is telling us that. And as the labor market weakens modestly over the coming quarters, that should mean that inflation comes off. So we are with the Fed in, on inflation. We do think that the recent increases in inflation, including in core PC, six-month core PC analyzed, heading up towards about 2.9%, we do think that there's a little bit of noise out there, and we do think that in the coming months, inflation should, along with the labor market, weaken. Where we are more worried is that the market seems to have, and I say the market, the equity market and also bond pricing, as you were talking about, seems to have this implicit faith that the kind of growth we have seen in Q3, Q4, and some of the early numbers in Q1 have also been quite strong. They're extrapolating that into the course of 2024 and 2025. And we think that's been extraordinarily strong growth, both from the consumer and also from the government. So the government sector has also contributed, including in investment. We don't think that will sustain. We think real disposable income growth is likely to come off. So we are looking for weaker growth. So for me, the left tail risk is much more on growth. And given what the market is pricing right now, yeah. right, in terms of in terms of rate cuts, we're actually in the we're we're in the camp that we think that receiving the very front end in the US actually does make sense here. You know, we don't see the two year getting much above four eighty. 
Banu, that's probably the, the most bear, you've been the, perhaps the most bearish guest that I've had um, and hanging your hat on data. In other words, you are concerned about a slowdown, you're concerned about the quits rate. Uh, and as you say, that left tail risk for you is more about growth. What does that do then in terms of, I mean, we asphyxiated yesterday for a moment in the bond market, an 11 basis point rise. There was a slight hysterical reaction. Given the roadmap that you've got, are you then pricing in higher or more rate cuts going into 2025 than perhaps the market is at the moment? And what is the consequence of that for asset allocation? Yes. So, so the answer to those questions is yes, we, we are uh, a little more concerned about the U.S. growth outlook than the consensus is. We are a little more concerned about earnings growth globally than the consensus is. So we are on the bearish side of consensus uh, uh, over the coming two years. Now, in terms of rate cuts, the market has now begun to price in less than three rate cuts for this year. We are looking for three rate cuts through the course of 2024, but where we are really different from consensus, where the market is, again, looking for about three cuts in 2025, we're looking for five cuts in 2025. So we would probably be small received in December 24, so one-year money, but we would actually be bigger receivers in one-year, one-year money. So net-net, that basically means that two-year at about 470, give or take, we find that quite attractive. I'm not saying that this is uh, topped to the second decimal point. There is a possibility of an increase, again, especially as this week we're going to see non-farm payrolls data, which we think is going to be near-term quite strong. That can lead to the two-year rising further. That can lead to further rate cuts being priced out, sort of the Bostitch view. But that will probably mean that 480 is, is sort of a top on the two-year, whereas the risk on the other side, if mm -hmm. we are right about growth concerns in Q2 onwards, Q4 of this year, could mean that we see the two-year coming down by about 70 basis points. So going forward with risk assets then into equities, I, un I understand owning the very, very short end, you pick up 4.7, okay. as you say, it is attractive. But if you're pensing in five rate cuts, that's on lower growth. That is not a pro-equity narrative, is it? No, it isn't, man. So, so in asset allocation terms, we are very much bonds over equities uh, across all regions, but particularly so in the U.S. Uh, we do think in the near term, the earnings picture for the U.S. market looks reasonably strong. And then, ironically, through the rest of the year, we are actually going to see tech earnings momentum come a little bit lower and it broaden out to the remaining parts of the market. So the, the market should remain reasonably steady, but at a time when bonds are rallying, bonds should outperform equities over the next 12 months. And we feel that that is the case for the U.S. We do think that's the case for Europe. China is a completely different conversation, so I don't think we can throw in China or, or Asia more broadly into that conversation. I think China, Japan, these are places where we certainly prefer equities over bonds. I'd like to be at dinner with you and Mark Hayfley then in terms of asset allocation to, to equities o o over the next 12 months. Um, you mentioned China. It is one of our most read stories this morning, the re-energizing re re story from Xi Jinping in the latter part of last year where he talked about the bond markets and perhaps being more active in those bond markets. I haven't got the verbatim in front of me. Um, do you see a risk of QE in China as the story pretends? Uh, we don't. So we were not looking, we don't think that the PBOC is going to be made to come into the market and uh, come into the primary bond market and, and buy bonds as actively. I think they will be active in the secondary bond market and uh, increasing their footprint out there. But we do think that the liquidity support, even if it's not through direct QE, we do think the liquidity support through MLF is likely to continue. Uh, I think the number to really focus on is the credit impulse and, more importantly, perhaps the fiscal impulse. Both of these have been pretty mediocre so far at a time when the housing market has not completely stabilized. So we do think that as the U.S. economy comes off the boil, as the Federal Reserve begins to, begins to be a little more dovish and the pressure on dollar renminbi, the upwards pressure on dollar renminbi eases, I think the possibility of China giving us more stimulus both in fiscal terms and in monetary terms is high. And ahead of that, uh, we don't want to be uh, very negative on Chinese equity. So this is a tactical call. This is not a five-year call, but more a six- to 12-month call. But this is a time when we think, unlike the U.S., where we have a strong preference for bonds over equities, in China, we'd much rather be in equities, particularly in certain selective sectors like the Internet sector. OK, brave call. Let, let's see what, what happens. Mind you, it is, it is a growing uh, course uh, that is joining you on that call. Banu, great to have you with me this morning. Banu Baveja uh, of UBS. Other stories trending on the Bloomberg Terminal this Tuesday morning. Rubik, a cloud and data security startup backed by Microsoft, 
has filed for an IPO, disclosing growing revenue and losses. The size and the price of Rubrik's planned share is disclosed in a later filing. The filing follows trading debuts by Reddit and Astera Labs. The Wall Street Journal reports that Disney is leading its proxy fight against the billionaire Nelson Peltz, with more than half the votes counted. BlackRock and T. Rowe Price are among the supporters. Donald Trump is paid a $175 million bond that will put a massive civil fraud verdict on hold while he appeals. Separately, the former president's net worth dropped by a billion dollars. This after the shares of his media company tumbled following the disclosure of a $58 million loss for 2023. And Elon Musk is now officially Austin's largest private employer. Tesla boosted its headcount in the region by 86% last year. Meanwhile, some of Wall Street are braced for Tesla's first sales decline since the early days of the pandemic. We'll hear more on that later this hour. And as Banner was just saying, they prefer uh, bonds to equities in the US. Uh, we have got a reaction function in the European and the UK bond markets on the back of that pretty significant move in 10-year government bond yields yesterday. Uh, Bund up by uh, five basis points and the UK up by nearly 10 basis points. Coming up, we have building tension in the Middle East after a deadly strike on Iran's consulate in Syria. The consequences and the response expected coming up on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Cranny in New York. Now, Iran is summoning the U.S. in response to what they call Israel's crime of striking Iran's consulate in Syria. The Islamic Republic says that it sent the U.S., quote, an important message over the airstrike that they claim killed at least seven people, including senior military commanders. Heightened tensions in the region are sending Brent crude to a five-month high. Let's bring in Dana Kresh, who has covering this story. What do we know so far? Because this actually is uh, a pretty high-ranking Iranian uh, forces have been killed. Um, but the details, Dana, good day. Hi. Um, Iran says that um, Israel is behind an airstrike on a compound linked to its embassy in Damascus, that's in the heart of the Syrian capital, killing at least seven Iranians, including a high-ranking commander and his deputy. Images out of Syria show that the building is completely demolished as a result of this airstrike. We saw Syrian media also saying that Israel was behind uh, this attack. While Israel doesn't really and rarely comments on, uh, on such attacks, whether in Syria or elsewhere that it is accused of conducting, Israel has repeatedly said that it would obstruct any weapons transfer to Iran-linked militias uh, via Syria or anything that would actually um, be a threat to its existence. And we see Iran today vowing to retaliate and saying that this would not go unanswered. As to who this person is, among them is a high-ranking commander who was in the Quds force in Lebanon and Syria. And that means he uh, perhaps is involved in foreign operations by by the, uh, the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps. Mm -hmm. And um, we saw Hezbollah calling him a loyal friend and someone who's worked to improve the work of the quote unquote resistance group in Lebanon for years. So, Dana, w with this in mind, w we listen to the Iranian language quite quickly. They talk about a decisive response. Do, do we understand what level of escalation that may well mean? I mean, if you look at escalation, given that Israel has struck Syria over the years, but this is a strike with a difference. So what escalation level is expected? So this strike is um, a direct hit on an Iran uh, consulate on an Iran embassy. So this is much different than previous attacks that Israel had conducted uh, since October 7 and this year as well. This year it really upped the ante uh, throughout the past several months and especially now with this strike. How Iran would retaliate of course remains to be seen. It could take a more calibrated response to not hit a nerve in the region and it is the one that's been saying we don't want to get involved in a wider war, uh, war in the Middle East. Um, earlier this year Iran did hit Erbil saying that they were attack attacking a uh, HQ, a spy HQ for the Mossad. Um, that really kind of escalated tensions between Baghdad and 
and uh, Tehran, but it was still calibrated and it was still within, I would say, rules of engagement. Okay, uh, Danit, thank you so much. Let's see uh, the, the, the line coming through from the Iranian Prime Minister, Ibrahim Raisi. Uh, the crime won't remain unanswered. Oil is trading at a five-month high. The markets are uh, in, in trying to calibrate uh, what happens next. You've got a number of other facets going on with the oil market as well, uh, not just the Israeli airstrike on the Iranian embassy in Syria, but also Mexico cutting its exports over the next few months, according to Pemex. Uh, the position in the market, net longs are at a 13-month high, and Brent crude trades at $88.72. So we have OPEC plus barrels off the market, and uh, we also have this heightened geopolitical tension uh, this, of course, will all play into monetary policy uh, and the risks of a second spike in inflation. More to come on Bloomberg. Good morning from New York. It is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Menis Cranny in New York. The yen is paring back some of its weakness against the dollar, driven by strong U.S. data. Still, the risk that Japan's currency will see intervention, it's rising at these levels. Let's take a listen to what Mark Mobius, the co-founder, had to say. The Japanese are fighting a losing battle, and they might as well give up. Uh, there's no way that they're you know, going to do anything to strengthen the yen, and it'll probably continue to weaken. Uh, at the end of the day, it's good, probably good news for some people because if you're shorting the yen, you're doing fine. But the other interesting thing about the yen and about Japan in general is that a lot of the Japanese investment money is finding its way into Southeast Asia and to emerging markets generally. And I think that's a very interesting development because they realize now that they have to make their mark uh, like China has been doing in these countries. And so uh, the yen will be distributed widely in these emerging market countries. Mark Moby, as we talk about how the yen, the weak yen, is supporting uh, the stocks, we're looking at a 50% upside in the last uh, 12 months for uh, Japanese stocks. I mean, how much more upside can be expected? I mean, the likes of Larry Fink says, as long as the yen remains at about 150, we can expect uh, Japanese stocks to continue to go upwards. The trend is your friend. Uh, it will continue to move up, uh, not because of the yen necessarily, but because of what's happening with Japanese industry and what's happening in the chip market. You know, the chip uh, revolution globally is becoming more and more intense with more sophisticated chips being produced. And Japan is at the forefront of this development. So that is going to help them a lot. And you notice that in Korea, the chip exports are really leading uh, the export revolution that's taking place there. Mark, as you say, Japan stocks, the trend is your friend. There's structural reform happening. Uh, yes, they've come a long way over the last couple of years, but it's not like they're long-term expensive yet. It still seems like good investment, but they're probably unlikely to continue leading the, the, the kind of gains in Asia, or do you think they can continue leading the gains? If you think it's somewhere else in Asia that can start kind of taking the forefront of gains, where is your pick of the other Asian equity markets? Uh, the pick for me is India. India is the place, even though India has come back a lot and it has even at some point outperformed the U.S. market, India has still got a long way to go. And by the way, Japan is going to play a role in India. Uh, as you know, relations between Japan and China have not been the best. Uh, China has been a big market for Japan, but they realize that this cannot continue and they're beginning to make a big push into India, and that's going to uh, boost not only Indian stocks, but also it's going to help the Japanese stocks as well, those who are going into India. That was the Mobius co-founder, Mark Mobius, speaking to the team a little bit earlier about yen and the possibility of intervention, perhaps fighting a losing battle. Just checking in, I mean, there was a skirmish in dollar-yen up to 158, uh, 151.80, I should say, uh, a little bit earlier. Now, we're off that, but here's the thing. The, the finance minister last week, Suzuki, made it very, very clear that they were willing to take bold measures on excessive moves. What are bold measures? Back in 2022, September and October 2022, the Japanese uh, authorities spent $59 billion. Well, what's it going to take to deliver a five big figure move? Nomura says it's going to take a significant several trillion yen to regrasp the narrative 
on the yen. The dollar this morning, as you can see, is flat after a little bit of a pop yesterday on higher short yields. Roll it over and have a look at the consequence in the bond market. You've got the European, uh, this is the 10-year government bond yields over the past two days, up 12 basis points. We've just had Banu Baveja from UBS talking about five rate cuts going into 2025. He is more concerned about the growth narrative than he is about inflation. Roll it over, have a look, uh, because this is where we are pricing at the moment. Uh, steepeners are the name of the game in the US. Germany playing the catch-up game up at seven basis points and the UK pops higher. Again, all repricing to the US narrative. Coming up, Moritz Kramer of LBBW joins me to talk about deficits and the risks to the world. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Menace Frenny in New York. Danny Berger is out for a well-deserved week break. Here's what you need to know. June rate cuts reappraised to the toss of a coin as the U.S. manufacturing snaps back. UBS plans to buy back shares worth as much as $2 billion beginning this year. And Tesla may be headed for a gloomy milestone as waning EV demand takes its toll on sales. A very good morning. Suddenly, stocks are a little bit more uh, harried by the prospect of higher rates. You're just showing a dip into the red uh, for the S&P 500. Tesla at the bottom of your screen. We're counting down uh, to the quarterly uh, sales numbers there. We expect 449,080 vehicles, uh, down by 7%. The stock is down 1.38% this morning. There's a gap. There's a gap between Fe the expectations of what the Fed will do and stocks. We've just had, more, we've just had uh, Banu Baveja of UBS. He is scathing on the growth side, not so much on the inflation side, and sees five rate cuts going into 2020. Do you want to be long stocks on five rate cuts if growth is under pressure? Uh, stocks in Europe are bid this morning, oil at a five-month high. We have the Israeli airstrike on Iranian uh, embassy in Syria taking oil higher this morning. The energy component, as you can see, is the alpha in Europe this morning, up 2.61%. On the bond market, as I said, uh, we have had this spike in 10-year government bond yields, uh, and that is just levelling out this morning at 432. But you did pop by over 10 basis points yesterday. The odds of a June rate cut have been shredded to less than 50%. There is a complacency in bond markets, according to JP Morgan. And uh, you've got crude, as I say, up 1.8% on the heightened tension in the Middle East and Bitcoin gives a little bit back as we reappraise risk. So you're down uh, on Bitcoin at the moment, you're down 5.1%. That's down 10% from its peak in March. So talking about debt uh, and deficits, the Citadel founder Ken Griffin is warning investors about the growing national debt. He wrote this in a letter. It is irresponsible for the US government to incur a deficit of 6.4% when unemployment is hovering around 3.75%. We must stop borrowing at the expense of future generations. My guest this morning is Moritz Kramer, Chief Economist at LBBW. Moritz, good to have you with me. You really do paint a pretty bleak, torrid situation, not just for the US, but globally uh, in terms of the debt situation. This is what you're saying. The fiscal situation in the US is even more unhinged. The debt ratio has doubled since the GFC to over 120% of GDP. Trend is rising as fiscal policy is irresponsible. More tax cuts may be on the way if Trump wins. I mean, are we going to hell in a debt handbag again? What is the risk to the world? Good morning. Good morning to New York, uh, Manus. Uh, yes, I think the risks are rising. I could just underwrite what we just heard uh, the quote. It's, it is really um, not only in the U.S., it's also in the Eurozone. It's basically everywhere, even in emerging markets. Despite this long period of ultra-low interest rates, public debt has risen to levels that we would have thought impossible only 10, 15 years ago. And this was during the good times. Now it's going to be many more headwinds uh, hitting us. Rising interest rates, of course, but also aging societies, which will cost a lot in terms of pensions, health care, long term care, but also probably more defense spending. And at the same time, the number of people in the workforce will probably decline for the reasons of, uh, of, of the demographic change and the aging. So this is really not sustainable and something's going to happen. Otherwise, we're going to hit another crisis um, and in the Eurozone probably earlier than in the U.S. because the U.S. still benefits from the uh, reserve currency privilege. Um, but even so, it's like a rubber band. And even the strongest rubber band, if you pull it too 
too hard and too tight, it's going to snap at some point. How quickly does this metas uh, you know, metastasize, Moritz? Because it's, it's a very clear thesis. It, it's based on the, on the rigidity of numbers, of debt to GDP, and extrapolating that forward. We saw the European debt crisis unfold for a, a very different set of reasons in the late 2000s, but 2007, 2008, yes. uh, in, into the early uh, 2011, 2012. How quickly will bond markets grasp what you're saying? Well, the bond markets are currently in a pretty carefree environment. If you look at sort of in Europe, we look at the benchmark uh, spread usually between the Italian bond and the, uh, the German 10-year bond. Um, and this so-called BTP spread was you know, like twice as high two years ago as it is now. So clearly there's not much concern currently. But if you look at recent releases from budgets, um, and we already heard the huge deficit in the U.S. in a situation of full employment. But also in Europe, we had a very negative surprise in France, where the deficit last year came out 5.5% of GDP, much higher than expected. In Italy, a, a whopping 7.2%. And now this interest rate additional cost will kick in. So if you assume that the yield curve moves up by 200 basis points compared to the low interest rate environment, and that's not unrealistic, it, this would add, when, once everything is rolled over in France, to 2% of GDP extra spending just on interest. In Italy, it's 3% extra spending just on interest. This clearly requires much more rigorous action to contain the public finances. Otherwise, um, investors will become nervous. And we know from the Eurozone crisis and many other crises before, this is not happening in a slow, linear fashion. This can be triggered by political or other events and can go very, very quickly. And right now we have a situation where the ECB has already sort of pretty much thrown in its way through QE, etc. It's going to be very hard to repeat this from the starting level where we're now. So the risks are rising um, and I think there's not enough um, anxiety in the market about uh, what this would mean in the medium term. And, and this is what I'm really sort of trying to grasp a hold of. Um, we saw a very existential moment in the gilt market, right? That was under Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. Are you saying that it, it, it's some kind of existential event that could trigger a crisis, or is it a slow brewing pot of horrors in the bond market? Well, the, the UK situation probably was, uh, was special because this was such a uh, horrendous policy mistake um, for everyone to see other than the government, apparently. Um, so uh, there's always the risk of a policy mistake happening. Um, but I think in the U.S., for example, it's, it's going to be much more gradual because if you have a situation where uncertainty rises, where, where, where the nervousness rises, usually you have a, uh, uh, you know, fleeing to, to safe havens and the U.S. government bond market still is that, even if the, the risks emanate from, from the U.S. as they have in the past. But remember the Eurozone crisis, when it all was triggered really by some revisions of Greek fiscal data. Now Greece is probably 1% of, of the Eurozone, and still it was enough to set in motion um, a crisis that kept the continent um, sort of in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in crisis mode for, for, for a couple yes. of years. So we cannot predict what will, uh, what will trigger it, but it's not going to be a slow process. How do you think the bond markets are going to react? I mean, you've done, you've done some modeling on a Trump election. You call it Trump reloaded. Uh, you currently predict a 53% probability of Trump winning. Um, although you say that is a declining trend, I, I'm curious, first of all, how much of a declining trend is that? And to what extent would a Trump victory, I suppose it depends on the complexion of, of how the hill turns out, but uh, how would that play out for bond markets in the first instance and, and risk? Yes, well, the, the probability of a Trump win is still more than even uh, currently, um, but uh, there's a lot of volatility also in, in the polling numbers, and of course the electoral system is very complicated. So I think it's, it's certainly not a foregone conclusion that the man will win. There's a lot of things that can still happen between now and November 5. But um, if he were to come back to the White House, um, I think there's at least a 50% chance that he's actually going to do what he says he's going to do, and that would be pretty detrimental. It would mean high tariffs, not only against China, I think that's a given almost, but against Europe as well, and pretty much everyone who runs a trade surplus with the U.S., which is pretty much everyone. Um, and uh, you'd also see 
probably more fiscal um, uh, stimulus through tax cuts, which are quite unaffordable at this uh, point in time. And this would, in my mind, lead to uh, a lot of uh, thinking in, on, uh, on the Fed side, uh, because clearly the, the cycle of lowering interest rates, which we expect will start in July, uh, will be torpedoed by such an environment because tariffs are inflationary and, of course, the fiscal expansion mm -hmm. would also be inflationary. So I would think that coming into next year that you would not only see the Fed slowing down, dialing down the, uh, the rate cuts if he is going full on, uh, but also that at the long end, um, the rates will rise and we will see a steepening of the curve as concerns about uh, fiscal probity will rise. So take it as Banu Bavage stepped out of that seat, you'll take the other side of the trade from him where he was calling potentially for five rate cuts in, in, in 2025 and the tail risk is growth. You, you would disagree with that? Well, man, it's, it depends on the scenario. I was saying this is like a... 50% uh, chance that he's actually going to do all these wild things that he claims he's going to do. Uh, but he's a transactional man in my mind. So he may also be much more moderate and say, OK, look, you've got to do something about, uh, about the trade deficit. Yeah. And uh, he may be going into deals as he's done uh, with the EU in 2018. And then it wouldn't really come to that. And we would see a continuation of the, um, uh, um, of, of the rate cutting cycle also into next year but the problem is we can't really know what he's going to do maybe he doesn't even know what he's going to do so uh, so i think the uncertainty and the possible volatility in the bond market next year um, and also closer to the run-up of the election will be much higher than what we were used to in the last couple of months. Moritz, great to see you again, and thank you very much for sharing your thoughts uh, on, on the time bomb that, that is debt in the bond markets. That is Moritz Kramer of LBBW. Coming up, the details on UBS's buyback plan. We'll discuss that next on Bloomberg. Good morning. Brief. I'm Manish Cranny in New York. So UBS are pledging a $2 billion buyback plan. That's for this year, and it targets completion of its takeover of Credit Suisse in the second quarter. Joining me now is Charlie Wells. Charlie, good to see you. The messaging from the buyback. Why is the stock dying on good news on a buyback? Hard question. Yeah, hard question, but also hard year, right? I mean, 2024 management of UBS has been broadcasting is going to be a very difficult year compared to last year as they try to complete this integration. You know, the heavy lifting, the chairman said, is about to come. They've got to dissolve the Credit Suisse legal entity into UBS. And they've also got the difficult task of trying to integrate the old IT systems from Credit Suisse into UBS. Investors have also been grumbling a little bit about some of the profit profitability targets for UBS. And so this is a way that they can try to, you know, at least keep some focus on the positivity coming out of that integration. And of course, it, it is just over a year from that fated weekend when the forced marriage happened. And that was the, the, the delay on buybacks and the dividend. That's the whole one of the key reasons why you want to be long that stock, but huge capital appreciation on the stock since the merger. Let's talk about City because, again, more job cuts coming through at Cities. What does it say about Jane Fraser? I mean, she, she was quite bullish in terms of the time frame of the restructuring, but does this add to that narrative? Look, earlier this year, Jane Fraser said that she was going to move quickly, but she was going to move thoughtfully <clears> on this restructuring. The plan was to cut some 20,000 jobs. And what people familiar with the matter told Bloomberg is that last week there was a fresh round of cuts in the investment bank, that technology, media, and telecoms were particularly hard hit. And this is just an indication that this seems to be moving very quickly. It comes as Credit Suisse recently said that it had completed the major actions of this reorganization. And actually, as far as scope, we're Getting a little bit of indication here on some on some cuts as well. City Group actually had to file with New York State their plans to cut 430 rolls. So it's seeming like this is coming to an end. Okay, and then over at McKinsey, if you're not up, you're out. What's going on? 
That's their famous motto. I mean, look, um, according to the Times of London, um, put, they put out a report that they were offering nine months of salary and some career coaching to some management as long as they promised to leave the firm. Now, this comes after last year, McKinsey embarked upon a plan to lay off 1,400 people. Those are rare layoffs. But what we do know is that the consulting industry has been under a lot of pressure as the companies that they advise cut back. And there's been a lot of questions about uh, consulting firms in general. So this is, is definitely a part of the difficulty that the industry and McKinsey are facing right now. A wonderful uh, remarketing of being fired. Strategically encouraged to reconsider the direction of one's career. Charlie, thank you very much. Charlie Wells uh, on UBS and City, uh, the moves there. Shares in Tesla, they're falling pre-market, trading. Uh, some analysts are bracing themselves for the company's first sales decline since the early days of the pandemic. This could be a, a fill or kill moment for the stock. Craig Trudell is with me. Craig, a lot of pessimism, and it, it's permeating this morning pre-market. So what do we think we're going to get? Yeah, I, I think the most uh, sort of remarkable move that we saw among the analysts last month was uh, Deutsche Bank. It's unusual that you see an analyst cut uh, an estimate not once but twice in the span of just a, a few weeks. Uh, the beginning of the month, they were seeing 476,000 units. Uh, they moved that down to 427,000 on March 11th. Last week, they went all the way down to 414,000. That would be down uh, from a year ago. The last time that we saw Tesla uh, report a year-over-year -year decline in deliveries was the second quarter of 2020. Uh, it, it's really, you know, not a, a development that we're used to seeing from this company. Uh, that being said, you know, the the company did uh, say early this year that uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, a markedly slower year for them. And I, I think the big concern for investors is whether there's, you know, sort of something to glom onto between now. And when this next generation vehicle that Tesla's been talking about uh, for, for years now, uh, whether or not they can accelerate that from, you know, uh, on the last uh, quarterly call, Musk was talking about that being a late next year uh, introduction, whether they can move that up or, or offer something to keep investors excited in the meantime is going to be key. I mean, the headwinds I, are, are coming hard and fast. You've got other competitors coming out with incentives. You've got price cuts by Tesla inside China. You've got BYD snapping other heels. Have they got a demand problem for Tesla or have they got other production issues? I mean, where, where is the, the biggest headwind for them? I, th I think it's a, a combination of, you know, sort of letting the lineup uh, languish a little bit. Uh, the Model 3 and Model y, y have been out uh, for quite some time. They're both, uh, you know, if we, if we sort of take a step back and, and uh, you know, look at how they're doing, they're actually, you know, doing quite well. The problem is they don't have reinforcements. The Cybertruck is not a high volume model. Uh, they're also, you know, for after all the price cutting they've done, they're much higher price than, you know, in, in China, uh, a lot of, you know, their competitors are, mm -hmm. are, you know, much lower than they are. And so they have a problem of, of product, uh, also of, of price. And I think just the general sort of EV slowdown, a real question as to whether or not you know, the early adopters who would be interested in EVs, whether that demand is satiated and whether uh, the industry as a whole is having some trouble converting uh, more of the consumers that have been reluctant to go electric, you know, to make that, that leap. Look, he, he's famous for his ability to make decisions literally overnight and on the fly. He's quite Machiavelli. What do you think Musk's strategy is going to be on this to ride it out? Well, I think it was interesting that last week, you know, Bloomberg uh, scooped this idea that he was going to, uh, you know, enforce this requirement that in North America, if you wanted to buy a new Tesla, you had to take a spin uh, to, to be shown uh, full self-driving, which uh, is misleadingly named. It is not self-driving, but it is a driver assistance system that Tesla feels really good about uh, and is something that Musk wants to, to really promote uh, and get people excited about. It's also a way for them to potentially boost uh, pricing because this is a, a feature that they still charge uh, $12,000 for, or you can subscribe to it for $1,200 a month. And so this is a, a product that perhaps is a way that they can use to kind of boost margins as uh, sales uh, growth slows and potentially even slips in the first quarter. Yeah, the old subscription, the subscription models are, are the best models. Now you mentioned the Cybertruck obviously isn't gonna be the winning volume play for them. But then I look at Xiaomi, 
uh, Xiaomi. They have their first ever EV, the SU7. How much of a threat is that to the Cybertruck? I think the the uh, you know reports overnight of of just how many orders there were for that you know right off the bat really speaks to the level of interest and we saw uh, also just uh, you know this is part of a pattern of we saw Huawei uh, late last year start to bring EVs to market and so you know it's it's really kind of ironic that you know there was all this anticipation of you know the Apple car that has you know fallen by the wayside but we've seen not one but two major Chinese smart, smartphone companies. Uh, enter the EV market, and it's really no surprise to see that in the sense that you know this has become a, a strategic industry for China and for Xi Jinping, where he wants China to really sort of dominate the global market. Uh, for for the moment, we're just going to see those companies play in China, uh, but there's absolutely am ambitions, you know, more broadly for for China to become more of a player on the global automotive stage. Craig, thank you so much. That's Craig Trudell. Well, we're counting down uh, to those quarterly delivery numbers. Uh, the stock is under pressure at the moment. Snapshot of risk. This is what we've got for you. Moritz Kramer joining me, warning of a debt crisis, uh, potentially more so in Europe than the rest of the world. So S&P 500 down by a tenth of 1%. Bonds level out at 433 after a pretty uh, virulent spike yesterday by 11 basis points on the back of the higher prices paid in strong ISM data. And the dollar is flat at 12.48. Coming up, we take a look at the market moving events throughout the day. A lot of Fed speak on the ticker. Good morning from New York. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Kranny in New York. Now, the backdrop to some of the movers that we have is that Bitcoin is down, down 10% from its highs in March. You're also uh, just seeing a little bit of an outflow from some of those ETFs. Uh, and we have got a whole host of stocks on the move for you. As I say, Bitcoin is lower, uh, down by about 5%. That's knocking Coinbase down by 2.8%. Uh, it's going to be a big week for uh, some of the some of the Fed speakers as well. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. CVS Healthcare uh, down by 5.25%. Again, uh, some pricing coming out yesterday, uh, late yesterday evening in terms of the health system here. There's the Bitcoin down by 5 uh, and an eighth percent, and that's playing through to Coinbase this morning. Uh, DJT, which of course is the social media company uh, of Donald Trump, announced yesterday some some data uh, yesterday about its losses, and that has knocked a billion dollars worth of the wealth of the president of the United States of America. And DJT is down by 3.8 percent this morning. In terms of what we're watching, a slew of economic data, it will hit the tape. U.S. factory orders, uh, light vehicle sales and jolts, a big day for FedSpeak, Williams, Mester, uh, Daly and Bowman, all delivering their remarks throughout the day. And the U.S. presidential primary takes place in Connecticut, Delaware, New York, Rhode Island and Wisconsin. That's it for Bloomberg Brief. Surveillance is up next. A very good morning from New York.